Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining. We are really excited for this webinar introduction to homelessness response and coordinated entry and we're thrilled to have so many diverse stakeholders from across the healthcare systems um, around the state and elsewhere join us for this to learn the basics of homelessness response and coordinated entry specifically and we'll also be going into um, some opportunities for you all to get involved once you know a little bit more about it. So we're thrilled to have all of you here. Thank you so much. My name is uh, Jillian Marchetti and I'm going to be moderating and largely presenting on this webinar with a few other folks that I'm going to introduce in just one sec. So I um, I'm a directing attorney at Homebase and I'll introduce our organization in just a minute. Um, and I have with me here, um, Michelle Schneiderman from the California Healthcare Foundation who is going to introduce herself in just a moment when we go to um, about two slides from now. So I'll, um, but I wanted to let you all know that she's here. We're excited to be doing this with the Healthcare California Healthcare Foundation. And then I also have with um, here with me, Erica McWhorter from the Contra Costa County Health Housing and Homeless Services. Um, and I'm gonna let Erica come off mute and introduce herself as well since she'll be jumping in with me later. Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining us. Um, um, my role is a little varied. Um, I currently um, function as a homeless services like chief as well as a chief of staff for our division. Um, and um, my division, the Health, Housing and Homeless Services is actually the health department in Contra Costa County. And our health department has a variety of lanes that we serve in, including um, we have a health plan, we've got um, public clinics and hospitals and um, behavioral health supports. And um, our division um, works and functions with all of those, including you know, our public health and environmental health and even our healthcare for the homeless division. So um, we've got a lot of um, internal and external partners, um, including um, the other health um, care agencies um, that are in the field and operating within um, our community. So it's great to be here. Um, and I look forward to speaking with you all about how homelessness and um, health intersect. Thanks so much, Erica. Really thrilled to have you here today. Okay, so our agenda for today, and we will be, we've had a couple questions already. Um, we will be sending out the slides. We're also recording this and we'll send out a link to the recording as well um, as a follow-up to all everyone who registered. Um, and today what we're going to do is in just a sec, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Michelle from California Healthcare Foundation to welcome everybody and provide a bit of context. Then I'm going to be going over with Erica's help, um, jumping in whenever, whenever she wants essentially, and she'll also be helping with Q&A, but we're going to cover a couple things. Um, uh, homelessness Response and Coordinated Entry 101, so sort of a primer on the basics of homelessness response and what it looks like um, in communities, and then specifically diving into one aspect of it, which folks may have heard about, um, but maybe not know a ton about, which is coordinated entry. And we're particularly gonna dive into um, an overview of opportunities for healthcare stakeholders to participate um, in coordinated entry in your, in your communities. Um, and as Erica just um, went over, she's a really, really great resource to provide some really specific and um, unique insights from the homeless response continuum of care perspective. Um, and particularly because Contra Costa is set up the way that she just described a really great link between the two systems. So excited for that. We will have a couple different opportunities for questions and answers throughout the presentation and then a longer, um, a longer Q and A session at the end. You'll notice hopefully that you have both a chat and a Q and A option in your, in your options. So you can use the chat throughout to chat with each other. We won't be, because there's a lot of attendees, we likely won't be able to monitor the chat for questions. So if you do have a question for me or Erica, um, please put that in the Q&A box. And it, to the extent that we can't answer them as we go written, we'll, we'll be able to get to as many questions as possible in our various Q&A sessions. So you don't need to wait to the end to ask a question. We won't be able to unmute folks. So the way to ask questions is through that Q&A box. Um, so please make sure that as we're going along presenting to you that you're entering any questions you may have and we'll get to as many of them as we can during this presentation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Michelle to introduce herself and the California Healthcare Foundation. Thank you, Jillian. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. It's so great to see how many people have joined us, and I'm really excited to be learning alongside with you. Um, so as Jillian said, I'm Michelle Schneiderman, Director of Advancing People-Centered Care at the California Healthcare Foundation. For those of you not familiar with CHCF, we're an independent not-for-profit philanthropy working to improve the healthcare system for Californians with low incomes and people who are not well served by the status quo. Our priorities are to get everyone covered, deliver better care, um, and to make care just. Last year, 
the foundation launched work to improve healthcare for people experiencing homelessness, promoting care that's responsive, person-centered, and really focused on the integration of physical health, behavioral health, and social needs. The cornerstone of this work will need to be robust partnerships among the healthcare, social service, and housing sectors. And the first steps toward meaningful partnerships involve learning more about one another sectors, the how and why we do the work. In that vein, CHCF commissioned Homebase to do some work to demystify the homeless response system for our healthcare and other partners and to report on how information sharing between the healthcare and homeless services sectors is happening in California today. We've published that work on our website and today are presenting the first of three companion webinars. We hope you walk away from this presentation with a better understanding of the homeless response system, but more importantly, what future partnership opportunities you can lean into to improve care and end homelessness in California. And now I'd like to pass things back over to Jillian. Thank you so much, Michelle. So as I mentioned before, I'm from, I am a, at an organization called Homebase that Michelle mentioned that we've been working with um, California Healthcare Foundation on this for the past many months and are really excited. They've been a fantastic partner and are really excited to have had this opportunity. I um, Homebase is a organization that works with communities across the state and the country on various things relating to improving their responses to homelessness. And um, one of my, the two sort of main areas of my personal work and expertise over the last several years of doing this have been coordinated entry and homelessness response and healthcare coordination. So I'm particularly thrilled to be on this project and also presenting this webinar to y'all um, to sort of as Michelle said, demystify um, for folks who don't work in homelessness every day what the homelessness response system looks like so you can better engage with that system and, and partner in meaningful ways for both systems. So I'm going to go ahead and um, get into it. So hopefully not many people on this need to be convinced of this, but we're really here because there is such a strong connection between housing and healthcare needs. We all um, know, and there's been a growing evidence base for decades at this point, that housing is a key determinant of health, that homelessness is correlated with both poor health outcomes and high health costs, um, and that housing linked with healthcare and other supportive services really improves both health outcomes and uh, reduces healthcare and other systems co costs in addition to improving housing outcomes. And yet, despite all this, there remains a you know, really strong disconnect between needs and access. So for people experiencing homelessness, um, they very often aren't able to effectively access healthcare, even if they're enrolled with Medicaid or other insurance. Um, there's a, this is due to a lot of things, right? Including lack of knowledge of healthcare resources that are available by both clients and the providers that are working to support them. Um, a lack of knowledge of how to access the resources and ensure that um, clients you know, stay engaged and can follow up. Uh, lack of accessible behavioral health care services in many communities and um, lack of you know very practical things like lack of transportation or just ability to get to health care appointments from folks who are living on the streets maybe or even in shelters or certain types of housing um, and a lot of that stems from the disconnect between the systems themselves right in most communities there's there isn't strong if any cross cross system coordination or even necessarily awareness um, regarding shared clients um, which results in a lot of you know missing information and confusion there are unfortunately not a lot of partnerships in many communities between homeless response system providers and hospital or managed care organizations or other stakeholders that work with this um, clientele. And especially a lack of data sharing across systems, particularly with respect to shared clients. So again, we'll, the data sharing piece we'll get to in future webinars, but um, just wanted to provide a little bit of context of why in particular we've been so focused on, on sharing this information and, and shoring up the knowledge of folks on the healthcare side of homelessness response. So we're going to get into that now, Some um, just a few slides on the basics of homelessness response before we dive into coordinated entry. So I'm going to go over some very fundamental information, um, the purposes and the basics of what we call continuums of care um, and the connection to healthcare. And Erica, please um, jump in at any point if you want. And after this, we'll have a, a quick Q&A about homelessness response before we dive into coordinated entry. So just some, again, fundamentals, and we'll have we'll have some materials, we'll share the link. We have some materials put together that dives into a lot of this in more detail. Um, hopefully not too much detail, but accessible detail. But so um, this is, again, just the sort of basics to provide the context for the coordinated entry presentation. So some key things to know about just homeless assistance in general is that despite the fact that it there is funding that comes from various um, government levels, including the federal government, the response itself and the assistance, the provision is really happening at the local community level. And in California, 
that doesn't exclusively, but largely means at the county level. Um, there's no, there is a lot of different kinds of funding that comes from various sources, including, as I said, various levels of government, but there's no single entity that administers all resources that are relevant to folks experiencing homelessness. There are a lot of different agencies and providers that are providing a lot of different types of assistance. And I'll go over some of the basics in the next slide. Um, and, um, and another thing to note is that because the resources are scarce in most communities, or at least there are not enough for everyone who needs them, the majority of housing assistance tends to be prioritized for folks who are unsheltered um, or those in emergency shelters. Um, and oftentimes is further prioritized for folks who have a disability and also have been homeless for long periods of time. So I mentioned there are a you know, variety of types of assistance. This doesn't get into all the details, of course, but some of the things, some of the key things to be aware of is that homelessness response looks like emergency shelter. It looks like temporary and permanent types of housing. There are additional types of assistance like transportation assistance, connections to necessities like food, um, so various types of supportive services, which I could never list all of the different options here. Um, and then also, of course, financial support, which can be one time or it can be things like ongoing rental assistance for folks. So one, oh, Erica, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. I just wanted to try and, if it's helpful, um, identify where some of the folks on the line might um, see themselves. If you could go back um, mm -hmm. a slide, um, I think um, it's important not to get caught up in trying to put um, ourselves as healthcare providers in a single box. And so um, in our community, um, what we see often is that um, while healthcare services, whether it's behavioral health, whether it's, um, you know, um, mobile case management support um, might show up more in the supportive services section, there are also opportunities for um, partnering around financial support, partnering for um, other necessities, partnering for transportation assistance, especially when we think about Medi-Cal um, and other types of billing. That's a really, really strategic way that our healthcare partners um, play a vital role in ensuring that the services get to the get to um, um, our folks. So uh, think of yourselves very broadly, not just in what you know you do, but in other ways where um, some of your services and resources might um, align with um, the with with what you hear here. Thanks, thank Jillian. You, no, thank you so much, Erica. That's a, such a great point. And also just to a good reminder, since we are going to dive into coordinated entry specifically, that there are, and we'll be talking about ways to participate in coordinated entry, there are even even so, somewhat outside of um, coordinated entry are always additional opportunities to, to partner and see yourself in the system. So thanks so much, Erica. So um, a, a big a big um, aspect of homelessness response that I'm sure many of you have heard of um, and even have some familiarity with, but not everyone has a lot of detailed information about is continuums of care or a COC. I know continuum of care means something completely different in the healthcare system, which makes it a little bit more confusing. So we wanted to provide a little bit of basics about uh, what COC means or continuum of care means in the context of homeless response. So, uh, you know, we mentioned that there are there's no single entity that administers all resources that are relevant to this population. Um, there are a variety of different agencies and organizations that, that do this work and are, are relevant to this response. Um, and a continuum of care or a COC is essentially the umbrella term for the groups of organizations and agencies that collectively work on and coordinate homeless assistance um, resources and activities in a given community. So just some very key things. And again, there's more details about these in the materials we'll share it after, but a COC is not is almost never a, a legal entity on its own. Each COC, and again, sort of thinking of that as a group of organizations, designates an entity to apply for federal funds for homelessness response and how to award those funds through an annual competitive process, which is actually in process right now. And as I'm sure Erica could tell you all kinds of about how fun it is to be engaged in that right now. Um, the primary purpose, <laughs> primary purpose of a COC is to promote the community's you know, system-wide or community-wide commitment to ending homelessness. Um, and as part of that, as part of the funding that HUD provides, it does require COCs to develop certain processes. And one of those processes is coordinated entry, which we'll be getting to in, in just a few minutes. So I'm not gonna, um, hopefully you can see these well enough. I'm not gonna get into all the details, but really just wanted to give a sense of like the variety of types of stakeholders who are who are and can be part of a COC ranging anything from kind of who you would expect like homeless specific um, resource providers and housing providers, but also 
uh, folks that are in the healthcare system, right? Hospitals, clinics, um, health centers, FQHCs, um, substance use treatment agencies, um, local governments and school districts. So a big variety of stakeholders that some, you know, sometimes in a given COC, there are more or less of these, um, but always it's always it's relevant to folks that are kind of run the gamut of these types of organizations to be part of the COC. So those are the basics of what we wanted as far as homelessness response. Obviously, coordinated entry is the next thing we're going to dive into, and that is, of course, part of homelessness response. But before we move on to that, if we have a question or two, we can try to answer if, um, Julie, if we have any questions about homelessness response itself before we move on. We don't have any questions now, but just want to let folks know um, if you have questions, use the Q&A. So click on Q&A and ask your question, and then um, I can say it out loud to Jillian and Erica. Thanks, Julie. And just as a reminder for folks, if you if you have a question rather than putting in the chat, if you could put it in the question and answer box, um, that'll make sure we don't we're more likely to get to it. Julian and Erica, there was a question that ended up in the chat by accident instead of the Q&A. Can I read it to you now? Sure. So it says, given the increase in overdose deaths, are there any efforts to require COCs to do naloxone distribution harm reduction based housing? There's no requirement about naloxone distribution, although I know some COCs do, you know, are, have worked on that and are incorporating it or working with healthcare providers to do trainings and, and distribute and things like that. Um, I don't, Erica, I don't know if you have, a, do you have a different perspective on this, but I would say um, harm reduction is almost required of COCs, not, not quite. I mean, housing first, which I think harm reduction often fits into, which is the idea that there should be as few barriers as possible to housing for folks, including those with substance use disorders and other um, related needs. So I wouldn't say harm reduction is required by COCs, um, but it is something that COCs are really encouraged to to incorporate into their systems. Erica, would you add anything to that? Sure. So um, two things. The first thing being, while the federal government or state government might not require us to do some of those um, things, um, each continuum of care has their own policies and procedures and even standards of care. And uh, mo more often than not, harm reduction policies, harm reduction programs are what um, are either strongly recommended or um, required. And a lot of times that identifies, um, by, that I, that, that is, um, a lot of times that um, is created um, um, by how the funding gets distributed. So when we submit or put out um, opportunities for um, stakeholders or providers to come and, um, engage in projects with us on behalf of um, people experiencing homelessness, a lot of times um, those, uh, re those funding will um, require harm reduction policies being in place. Um, in terms of our community, we actually um, do partner with Healthcare for the Homeless. Um, a lot of our local clinics, um, even non-county run clinics, private clinics to ensure that um, those um, resources are available for um, accidental overdoses. Um, and we even train our um, homeless system providers once or twice a year on that, including first aid and, and so forth. So there's many opportunities to, um, to include that in, in the continuum of cares um, purview. Thanks, Erica. I know we might have a couple more questions in the bank. I'm going to move us on to get into coordinated entry, but we'll, um, we, again, we have a longer period of Q&A at the end. So to the extent we still have questions, we can um, get to those later on, but I appreciate you all putting your questions in. So I'm going to turn now to coordinated entry, which again is a key aspect of, of homelessness response and is one of the processes that's required by, um, by HUD um, as part of as a con you know, contingency of its funding for communities to implement. So we're going to go over, again, the fundamentals, the basic purpose and benefits, and then the key components, and then um, highlight some, some opportunities for healthcare stakeholders to get involved. So again, just some very basics that there's more, there's more details in the materials that we'll send out after this, but coordinated entry is at its base, um, a process that every COC, so you can think of it as every community, maybe like county-ish, um, sets up to ensure that people that are experiencing homelessness or at risk of experiencing homelessness are prioritized for the resources that are in the community based on severity of need, and also that people are matched to the, whatever the available resources are that are most suitable to meet their particular needs. 
So the primary purpose of coordinated entry is to allocate housing and resources as fairly and appropriately as possible to folks who are most vulnerable. Again, just a very few key things to know. Um, it is required by both HUD and also um, most sources of, many sources of California funding that's related to homelessness response. There are six key components, which I'm gonna outline next. Participation is um, open to non-HUD funded organizations, even though those are the only folks HUD can require to participate. Um, and there are some key requirements as part of uh, the coordinated entry requirement, but COCs have a lot of flexibility in designing and implementing what theirs specifically looks like. And we'll get into some of the opportunities where healthcare providers can maybe be part of those, um, those conversations. Um, there's also a required annual evaluation process. Um, so though even if you're, <coughs> excuse me, even if your community has been implementing coordinated entry for a number of years, there's always opportunities for improvement and so always opportunities for involvement. So in general, coordinated entry is meant to provide an opportunity for communities to really rethink um, and reconceptualize and, and reorganize how they were delivering housing and services to folks. It's meant to streamline um, and simplify the access and referral process to resources, to really focus on more fair and equitable access to resources. And again, to be a standardization and housing first to really make sure that you're prioritizing folks with the highest needs. Excuse me. So this is meant to be just a basic graphic of kind of with or without coordinated entry or before and after. The idea is essentially here that without coordinated entry or before coordinated entry, most communities had lots of different programs that each had their own processes, each had their own intake and assessment, and um, many were more kind of first come first serve. So folks had to kind of, folks who needed help would have to figure out which different organizations to go to, apply to those different organizations for their resources. And so it was a much more sort of um, ad hoc process. And that, you know, that image is meant to suggest that there's all these folks trying to get to resources. And it's a bit of a maze to actually figure out who has the resources you need and then actually apply to and get them. So with coordinated entry, which is the column on the right, and that, that graphic is meant to sort of suggest that no matter where folks kind of come into contact with homeless response agencies or providers, that they go through a single streamlined coordinated process of getting assessed and prioritized and then referred to the right resources that are available in the community, regardless of who holds those resources and where they showed up at the system to get them. So the idea is to have a, um, for the folks who are, who are experiencing homelessness and seeking help, a more um, coordinated, standardized, you know, easier, simpler process to get connected to resources and for the system, a way to actually evaluate folks based on need and then connect them to the right resources regardless of where they are in the, in the community. So I mentioned there were six key components. I'm gonna walk through them, um, just give the basics of each one because that's a good context for them kind of diving into where the different opportunities are for healthcare providers to engage. So it goes system entry, um, assessment, prioritization, matching, referral, placement. And I'm gonna walk through each of those um, one by one. So system entry is um, hopefully what it sounds like, but it's essentially, you know, clients or folks experiencing or risk of homelessness are seeking housing or other services, and they make contact with, you know, the COC's homeless response system in some way. Usually that looks different in every community, but usually it's by, you know, it could be interacting with an outreach worker, calling a hotline um, that's, that connects you to services, or showing up at a service provider site um, that is identified as, you know, an entry point to the system. At that point, anyone who has, you know, entered the system in that way is then assessed in a consistent man matter um, using a uniform assessment tool or decision making process um, with standardized tools across the system. So as far as the assessment itself, there's a lot of uh, various factors It varies community to community, but some common, common and relevant factors that you would look for in assessing are um, information about each person or household's needs, their strengths, their preferences, barriers they may face when they're trying to secure housing the length um, of past and current episodes of homelessness and, and other characteristics that might make them more vulnerable while experiencing homelessness. I just wanna point out too that most, our, most assessment information is self-reported by that person or household you know, engaging with the system. Um, and there are various reasons that people may under-report um, certain conditions for different reasons. So just wanted to let folks be aware of that. 
So once clients are assessed, um, they're then based on the information that was collected during the assessment process and other data prioritized for the different resources and, and housing that's available in the community based on factors that were agreed upon by the COC. And the point of this, right, is to ensure that given the limited resources that they're used for the most folks who are most in need um, and the households who need assistance the most are prioritized for housing and services and also um, so that we're so that it's less first come first serve and more needs based right and prioritization scheme so the factors basically that are used in each community are decided by each community they're usually taking into account things like uh, the severity of service needs or vulnerability and considering factors like risk of illness risk of death or victimization history of frequent use of crisis services including emergency medical services and also significant physical or mental health challenges, substance use disorders, functional impairments. So anything that speaks to severity of service needs or vulnerability, but it, the combination itself and the particulars can vary community to community. As so once you know you have a prioritization list of folks who are who have connected to the system as so then as housing resources become available clients at the top of a community's priority list are given a choice um, to accept those resources for which they're eligible um, and which appear to meet their meet their needs. These last few pieces sometimes happen um, in coordination with one another, but are technically kind of separate piece, phases of the process. So once clients are matched with a resource, um, they're then referred to the program that holds that resource. And that, of course, requires communication at, right, at various levels between those who made that matching decision, the client themselves, um, and the program that has the resource that they're going to be providing. And then finally, clients are placed into the program that holds that resource and ultimately into housing, which usually entails you know, making sure the clients are um, so-called document ready, which is basically any documentation that's required to verify eligibility for the program um, or otherwise sort of you know, documents and information that's needed for, for example, if they're going into private market housing um, for landlords, what they're requiring, that kind of thing. So supporting clients to kind of gather the information needed and documents needed are is part of this process. Um, and, and really requires working with both the client, the program, and other partners to make sure that the, the client is um, able to address any barriers to housing placement and, and long-term stability. So before I'm going to go through each of those steps again, but particularly point out the the opportunities within each of them for healthcare providers to to get involved and think about partnering. But before I do that, are there any questions generally about coordinated entry or its key components? Erica, you're answering one of the our last question. Erica has been answering questions as we move forward, Jillian. Oh, great. Um, Erica, are you on board for maybe verbalizing the answer to the one you're starting to type about using the same assessment form? Sure. So um, while different communities can identify their own assessment forms, these forms or actually tools um, can be for um, a variety of purposes, including to triage clients into um, various services. So you could have a triage tool that is um, that the community has developed um, that is unique to the community, but that's applied in a standardized way across that particular community. But that triage tool doesn't have in Contra Costa, for instance, our triage tool is not the same triage tool that Los Angeles County uses. We might have some of the same questions and we might even weight some of the responses um, similarly or the same, but that tool doesn't have to be the same among different communities. However, within when we're administering the tool for fairness, for equity, and just um, essentially to make sure your data is coordinated, streamlined and accurate, you want to use the same tool um, internally. Um, and so, yes, you can have multiple tools, you can have um, different tools, but you do need to standardize those tools internally. Thanks, Erica. And if there were other, if you remember, if there are other questions you answered that you think others on the line might have and you want to share some of what you, you answered verbally, please feel free, but otherwise maybe I think there's one one question that probably everyone would benefit from and so in terms of the referral component of coordinated entry what types of programs have available resources so what you know vouchers and that kind of thing so if you could just speak to that a second for a second um that's a that's a big question and so the the real answer is 
all resources are going to be community-based. So whatever nonprofits or local government agencies exist in your community, that's typically going to be the range of resources that the COC has to draw from. That said, not all of those resources are actually connected to the COC or connected to the COC's coordinated entry system. So many coordinated entry systems are still, you know, um, in their process of development and they're always growing as the continuum of care grows, as your population of um, people experiencing homelessness grows, the kinds of resources you'll need to bring in to serve them will also change and grow over time. And so what happens is the community through the COC needs to identify what resources are needed um, by their um, uh, clients experiencing homelessness. And those are the resources that they prioritize for um, access, accessing the system of care and accessing uh, and being able to um, have access through the coordinated entry system. In an ideal world, all of the resources would be available through coordinated entry, meaning um, if you had a voucher uh, or vouchers in your community, those vouchers always go through your public housing authority. Sometimes local um, agencies have other vouchers that they create um, for purposes of um, that match what the federal government vouchers um, do. But for the most part, those vouchers come through the public housing authority. And the public housing authority can either, you know, identify how many they want to make accessible to the um, continuum of care, or can even say, hey, you know, we have this number of vouchers available, um, but we would like um, to partner with you so that you're not necessarily taking people directly off of your coordinated entry list, but we want some of the people who are on our way list to get some of those vouchers. And so there needs to be a negotiation and a planning um, and even sometimes a project set up so that you could make sure that the resources that that entity has in this example, the Public Housing Authority, that they um, um, are able to, you know, refer clients in and or, or receive referrals from the system of care. So that's a little bit messy, but the way you want to think about it is if the resource exists in the community and they have partnered with the COC, um, oftentimes they could um, accept and receive referrals through coordinated entry. Sometimes those referrals don't go through coordinated entry, but that resource still exists. And there are also times, and this happens very frequently, where the COC is, really relies on um, the nonprofit stakeholders in the community, the clinics in the community, to reach out to their networks and make referrals that way. So all of the resources don't always live within the COC's purview, but sometimes the, the nonprofits take it upon themselves to um, make make their services more holistic by making sure that um, the clients that are seeing them do have access to um, other networks for um, support. I hope that answered the question. Erica and Jillian, um, there's a question about if a client crosses county lines, does the whole coordinated entry process have to start over or does the existing info and assessment travel with them? Um, the answer to that, unfortunately, in almost every case is yes, it does start over. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's it's not literally always county lines, it's COC geography, but that is often, especially in California, along county lines. Um, so unfortunately, the answer is yes. There are some areas like I know the area communities or COCs have been talking about potentially figuring out a way at some point to, to coordinate better so that that's not always happening. And I know that um, this may be a piece of what we're going to present in the third webinar, which is about data exchange to the extent that um, communities are envisioning a ways around that. But yeah, basically, the answer is yes, you have to start over when you're in a new, a new COC. You'll have a lot of great questions, I think, um, and I appreciate them. Some of them, I'm looking at them quickly. A few of them we'll get to a little bit in the next chunk of slides. Some of them are, are answered in the materials we'll send out after. Um, and to the extent we don't get to questions that you've submitted today, we'll try our best to figure out a way to answer them as part of the follow-up. But I really appreciate you all continuing to put your questions in. I'm gonna um, move us along though into the, um, into the key opportunities portion, which again, we're gonna go through each of these uh, key components of coordinated entry again, but specifically honing in on, on some types of, this is not a comprehensive list, but some ways that you can start to think about how um, you as a healthcare system stakeholder or provider could potentially participate in coordinated entry. 
So the first again is at the at the point of entry into the system, right, um, where people are entering into or like seeking services in the front in the first place. Um, some of the some of the things that are really important or could be great for healthcare system stakeholders to do are um, do your best to you know connect with your COC to learn about the basic eligibility requirements um, so that you know which of your patients would might be eligible for homeless services um, and so you know who to, you know who who to connect to the system. We had there were questions about in the chat about how do you know which resources your community has that varies by community. So essentially, there's lots of basic questions to be. Um, talking with your your local COCs about in terms of you know what resources are available, um, who who are the people that you're able to serve, so that you have a better sense of you know which patients you want to you want to make sure get connected to the coordinated entry system and and what they might have available for them. Um, uh, likewise, you know understanding what the entry points are um, to your community's coordinated entry system. If it's if it there's if there's a phone line, if you if it's only you know certain physical locations, if it's any provider, just that's going to vary again community to community. Um, developing protocols within your own either um, program or across the system, ideally for notifying, you know, home, homeless outreach teams if they exist in your community um, or or otherwise the entry system, so that you have a way to potentially connect um, eligible patients to get them connected to this to the coordinated entry system. And then, of course, um, it's possible. It's not. I wouldn't. I don't know whether I'd say it's common, but there are some um, healthcare providers who do act as entry points to the coordinate entry system, um, which basically can help to reduce the burden of patients um, and increase the likelihood that they'll actually be assessed and prioritized for resources in the coordinated entry system. And again, these are all just some basic ideas. There's, of course, if you're if you're working with your community directly with your COC, they may have some additional ideas, or you may come up with some additional ways to to you know um, participate in each of these points of the system. So, if we're thinking about the assessment point of of coordinated entry, some different ways that you can um, get involved would be to help review or select or even develop assessment tools. You know, Erica did a really great job earlier of describing the kind of nuances of the assessment tool or the assessment process. I and mean, it's not just, most communities don't just use one assessment tool and there's one assessment point. It's often um, a little bit more involved in that. Um, but so to the extent that you can be involved in understanding what assessment tools your COC does use and getting um, involved in making sure that the questions that are part of that assessment process or the information that's being gathered is more accurately capturing health-related vulnerabilities or health-related needs of clients being assessed. You can also, um, you know, this is somewhat related to system entry, but making sure that you are notifying the coordinated entry system of patients that you have that you feel are eligible and should be assessed as part of the coordinated entry system. Um, and then also things like providing like literal space for the assessments to take place. It's often, you know, it's really important to have spaces that are private and where folks feel safe to be um, asked a lot of very often very personal and um, specific questions. And so having spaces is often a limitation for some CSEs. So if you have, you know, um, rooms that you can have these assessments take place, that can be really helpful. And also even training some of your staff um, or having some of your staff trained by the COC to administer some, some of the assessments yourselves um, is another, another way to get involved. At the prioritization point, um, you know, we mentioned that communities develop their own prioritization schemes and identify different factors that they use to prioritize folks for housing and services. And so to the extent that you can work with your coordinated entry system, your COC, to make sure that what you think are critical health considerations are factored in to that prioritization scheme, that can be really, really valuable. Um, as well as this, this again varies by, by COC, but some um, have case conferences or other ways where they um, might adjust the prioritization um, position of a, of a certain household or individual. And so if you can either be involved in the case conferences yourself to explain maybe why there are specific health conditions that should like would warrant you know, an individual being prioritized more highly than the standard protocol might suggest, that can be one way. Um, and if not actually participating, then just kind of informing the kinds of decisions or questions that should be asked at those kinds of, um, in those kinds of discussions or decisions. At the a matching point, um, some ways to get involved are again. This is often this is this varies by community as well, but there are often case conferences um, or some sort of matching process whereby groups of folks in the COC um, will, you know, when a resource becomes available or there are resources available, looking at the prioritization list and checking eligibility and also kind of figuring out who that's prioritized or at the top of the priority list would be a good match for that um, 
often, but does it always happen in things like case conferences or other decisions? So again, participating either in the case conferences themselves to increase the likelihood that um, folks with health, particular health needs are getting appropriate matches, um, or at least kind of informing the process. And then of course, working with patients of yours or clients um, or folks, even if they're not your patients, but clients with health needs to kind of really understand their options and how each might impact their healthcare access or outcomes. So for example, if, you know, if, if a housing opportunity is located in a place where it's going to really impact the person's ability to get to follow-up appointments or that kind of thing, like that's a good thing to, really important thing to help folks understand. So those kinds of, those kinds of considerations are really great to have healthcare providers or other stakeholders involved with. Um, on the referral piece, um, you can offer, offer support to housing providers. This is a huge one, I'm sure, if there were additional housing providers that were on this um, panel talking would um, really emphasize how much it's, it's helpful to have the provision of healthcare or other services um, available to clients when they get into housing um, to increase the likelihood that, that folks who are referred to and accept housing placements are successful in those housing placements. Um, and then also, Another area we, we talked about, you know, document readiness earlier, but the um, particularly the lining up or getting disability verification can be a really helpful place where healthcare providers can can support the COC because for some types of housing programs, um, a disability is is an eligibility requirement, and so being able to um, provide that disability verification is something that's that's really important that healthcare stakeholders can can help with. And then finally, on the placement front, um, providing or helping support the provision of transportation to help clients get to appointments, either before or after housing, um, or, or to get to other things they need. And then really important, this relates to what we were just, I was just going over, but following up with clients either you know, on their way to housing or once they're housed to ensure that they continue to connect with um, needed healthcare services and to, again, support long-term housing stability. And the last opportunity area I want to go over before we open it back up for questions, and we'll have more time in this session for for our Q and A. Um, but I wanted to talk about data, not not get into a ton of depth, but um, just point out the opportunities here that COCs and coordinated entry operations generate a lot of data, um, and often it's collected and COCs don't often have the capacity to do a lot with it, even though there's lots of opportunities to do really helpful things with it. So like like evaluating system performance or program performance or identifying system needs. Um, and because COCs often lack staff capacity and expertise to really identify and address um, data quality issues or perform really meaningful data analysis or determine the most efficient use of all this data that they're collecting, um, healthcare stakeholders can be really, can provide really invaluable support to COCs by helping to contribute expertise and time towards things like you know, regular review of data quality, um, developing metrics or monitoring progress or, you know, performing various kinds of data analysis to identify areas for improvement. And I think I saw Erica maybe wanting to jump in here. So if that's the case, I will welcome it. Um, I'm so busy typing. Uh, what was it? <laughs> Is there a specific question? I have so no, I, about data. No, no, I, no, I just... I thought you. I, I thought I saw you going for the uh, mute button, so I thought you had something you wanted to, to add in particular. Okay, no, I appreciate you answering questions, and I'm sure the folks no. who are asking do too. No, I think when you guys go into this, um, you'll when you have a dedicated time for this, that'll probably be the ideal time. Okay. But one of the things um, that we have done um, is uh, we. We partner in multiple ways with the various other divisions of our health department um, to create dashboards, to do data sharing. We've got shared, um, uh, we've got, uh, we've got shared um, uh, data management systems, um, and that also helps with coordinated entry so that there's not a lot of like, how do we get this person's information over there? Is it a file we're sending? How do we encrypt it? Like all of the nuts and bolts and any, you know, you know, really nitty gritty pieces of it. Instead, we do have agreements in place. And as part of our, and you'll get into all of this, but as part of our um, data agreements and releases of information, um, it makes it possible for us to do this in a much 
more streamlined way. Um, and it also makes it possible for us to look at data across our department around like what kinds of people are we seeing and cross referring? What kinds of people um, are in needs of what kinds of services? And so you can do, you know, cost estimates and planning um, and, and launch larger initiatives. Like in our community, we've just launched what's called Living Contra Costa. And so we're looking at various metrics, um, including that data and that shared database to help us identify how we can improve our services and where there might be need for us to kind of reevaluate some of our budgeting and all of the different things. There's just so much opportunity there. Thanks, Erica. And yeah, we'll definitely, uh, the third of this webinar series um, and also a report that I will link, that, uh, that is linked in the slides um, gets much more into various things around data and especially coordination between housing and healthcare. But Erica, I appreciate that. Um, that context as well, but just to yeah, assure people that there is, there's lots more to talk about, as Erica said, about around data and some of that um, we'll get into in our, our final webinar of the series in that report. So we're, we have the rest of our time essentially with minus a few minutes at the end to wrap up to, to answer some more questions. So um, I know there have been various coming in and Erica's been answering some of them, which is great, Erica, thank you so much for doing that. But Michelle or Julie, are there questions you wanna? Absolutely, lift up? Uh, so one of them is, um, our to talk a little bit about clinical review of current housing status for clients and how that can help um, in the assessments and um, prioritization, especially if um, through the self-assessment or the traditional CE, they're scoring low, but the healthcare provider might have more information to share. If you could talk about how they can play that role to help that move forward. Um. Sure, and Jillian, if you all have any additional insight from other communities, please jump in. So um, one of the things I started to type was how um, this is an issue we've seen around the country and it, it has come up um, in the context of um, really addressing inequities in our system of care, particularly how persons of color, um, it have, it, the trends have shown um, sometimes persons of color um, under report in an attempt to make sure they are better situated to qualify when in reality, you know, we as healthcare providers know this full well, like under reporting does not help us solve your problem. Like we need to know what your concerns and issues are so that we can make sure we um, um, we set you up with the right services and resources and, and, and the help you need. And so for purposes of, um, um, and there was a similar question that I responded to earlier, but uh, for purposes of like, how do we get a more clinical assessment so that there can be more accuracy mm -hmm. in the um, in the assessments and, and the way we're going about supporting people, that is a, that is a tricky bit. And so um, for the most part, um, clinical assessments aren't done at the front end. There's no time to do that. There's no capacity to do that. Who's going to pay for that? How does that just logistically and realistically, how does that happen? And so we do rely on self-report, at least initially, and to get people's names on the list and open them up for access to the resources that are currently available in the system. Usually that allows for them, that kind of triggers the opportunity to engage with case management who can then also help to identify, oh, you might have you know, some communication issues or, oh, I don't see you have you know, any, um, like you, you, noted, you, you said you don't have any medical insurance. So when was the last time you actually saw a doctor for that diagnosis you got when you were 12, Mr. 50 year old man. So it's those kinds of things that tip us off to let's go ahead and connect them to services now and get that um, get that clinical assessment um, in place, that support in place. And usually, um, at least in our community where we've seen the clinical assessment come into play to help readjust that score is when we are at the point of getting ready to either reevaluate folks. So when you're sitting in the, um, on the housing queue, the community queue waiting for your opportunity at housing, um, Ideally, we will be reassessing people every, you know, so often. And it's it's lucky if we do get to you every six months. But that is an opportunity to update what your status is. Are you pregnant? Have you gotten married? Did you have a child? You know, um, did you have a heart attack in the meantime? Like what what's going on with you? And so that's another opportunity to bring in clinical support to help um, with that person. Does that happen at that stage? 
rarely, just in all honesty, rarely. But what could have happened is having the person on the queue, getting them connected to case management, they might have then had that opportunity to get connected to um, medical personnel who can then help them identify what their current needs actually are. So that when you do the second assessment, that's when you can get that updated information. The other place that can happen um, to get updated information or to kind of level the playing field um, is in the housing placement committee. So once a person's on the housing queue and it's like, oh, it's your turn. We've got housing available for you. We're gonna pluck you off the queue and we're gonna have a big meeting for you to talk about like what resources are available and which one will be the best fit. So we're gonna invite your case manager. Maybe we are um, inviting your, um, your therapist or your whoever, um, but we have those folks sitting at the table who can talk very specifically about your needs and so and can say, oh, they might have scored initially in the rapid rehousing range. You'll get to all of this at some point, <laughs> but but maybe they really need permanent supportive housing, something with more intensive services. And there's people at the table who can speak to that and then that person can be placed appropriate. So that's typically how that can work. Thanks so much, Erica. The only thing I want to very quickly add to that, because I think it relates to, again, our, our final webinar and the data report, is that while most communities do prioritize based on information that is collected via an assessment tool, like a, like a sort of an interview or, or a tool like that, you can also inform your prioritization decisions with like any other information that exists. So you don't have to just say, we have this tool and we answer these questions and this is how people are prioritized. So to the extent that at some point a community gets to the point where there is some data sharing happening between healthcare systems and the homeless system, if there is existing information about someone's condition that can be shared in some way, which again is, is a topic for the last webinar, um, that, that information can also inform prioritization decisions and matching decisions to be more accurate so that it's not just dependent upon you know, self-report or those assessment tools being administered via an interview with a client. Um, there's, there's a question that kind of gets at a bigger picture issue in terms of how COCs work. Are there other remedies or processes that would be helpful to know about for individuals who may not qualify for um, coordinated entry based on particular criminal history, sex offender status, and are those restrictions that um, limit some of the services people can get from HUD statute specific, or are they specific to the local COC? Um, that, that answer would probably take a very long time, but we can do our best in a few minutes. So, I, so first of all, um, just because a person doesn't, for various reasons, either because they're not, they don't meet the eligibility requirement of like, homelessness, for example, or there are other reasons. And that's really the only reason a person wouldn't be, I think the way it was phrased was like eligible for coordinated entry is just if they are not homeless or don't meet or aren't, um, don't meet the definition of at risk for homelessness. Um, but at that point, they can make, there can be referrals to, you know, other resources that might be relevant. And a lot of those are within the knowledge base of folks who work at coordinated entry. So if someone is not eligible for homeless services, essentially, is the only reason they wouldn't be at least like couldn't be entered into the coordinate entry system. Um, as far as like particular histories, like criminal background or that kind of thing, there are some resources that are somewhat limited based on very, you know, based on particular types of backgrounds. Almost, almost none of those restrictions or prohibitions are mandated at a federal level. I don't want to get into all the details because again, that could go, go on for a while, but um, particular barriers to housing are things to be addressed and minimized via the coordinated entry system and by working through the homeless response system, not reasons that someone wouldn't be able to at least like enter the coordinated entry system. I hope that's mostly answering Eric. I don't know if you have anything else to add. Yeah. Um, when the state identifies priorities, which state agency does that here in California and how do they do that? Do they do that through guidelines, issue briefs, funding, or what is the process? I don't know. Do you, I mean, is it, is, I don't know if that question is getting at like the fact that if you're receiving state funding, you're required to participate in coordinate entry and like implement housing first. Yeah. So just um, asking like, where, who are the responsible agencies in the state of California that deal with homelessness maybe is more specific? Well, yeah, that's a little bit, it shouldn't be as complicated of a question as it is. There's various different agencies that fund different types of homeless services and resources. So basically any of those state agencies that do that can put strings attached <laughs> to their to their various mm -hmm. um, funding. 
I believe the housing first requires some of the requirements, the, the state, various state agencies are kind of in agreement or there's actual state, there's actually a state code like state law that says you have to comply with housing first if you're funded under any of these, which is basically, I think the easiest way to think of it, even though it may not be literally 100% the case is that any state funding that relates to serving folks who are experiencing risk of homelessness has certain requirements. There's also um, a state, inter essentially a state interagency council on homelessness, but it's called um, the housing and fire, Erica, housing, finance and community yeah, yeah, housing, um, finance and coordinating council, HCM, yeah, yeah, yes. and, yeah, and then also, um, HCD, which is housing and community development is another primary state agency that is, um, works on homelessness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's, it, there's a difference between prioritization and funding requirements. And so yeah. um, the state typically doesn't say you need to prioritize this or that. If they have, if they want you to prioritize something, they usually, um, the state and even funders will usually come out with a very specific funding stream dedicated or targeting that particular thing. Um, and the reason for that is because they want to make sure that that thing gets funded. And if they just open it up for like, oh, you can prioritize it amongst all these other things, they might not um, get to what they're um, what they're trying to do. So it's a it's a it that's a bit of a loaded question. Um, but for the most part, prioritization is a local issue that happens with a local community based on local community identified needs, whether that's politically or whether that's part of the COC's purview um, or whether it's just based on data. So um, that's something that you want to look to your local community for. Thanks, Erica. I think that's a perfect way to respond to that or like end up that response too, because I think the, the, the sort of ultimate suggestion as like a first step or a next step is to connect with your local COC in your community because a lot of a lot of what will be relevant to how you partner how you participate will be at that will be because of the local level decisions or the way that they're participating and so the nice thing about the nice thing about it is that you don't have to be of partnering is that you don't have to become an expert on all things homelessness response or like why certain requirements happen from the state level or federal because you can lean on your homeless response partners to to hold that expertise right um so uh, with that, I know we're, we're at time, so I'm going to wrap us up quickly. I have the slide up now that's um, encouraging and reminding folks that we do have two other webinars in this three-part series. The next is going to dive into some specific community examples of the kind of, you know, we, we went over some opportunities today, but we're going to actually provide some examples of um, part of coordinated entry partnerships and the way that healthcare providers are actually participating in coordinated entry. And then our final webinar um, later in September is on the sharing data across um, health and homeless systems of care. And we do have two resources related to this, the Homeless Response 101, which is essentially additional details to kind of color in what we went, we went over today um, and getting into some of the examples. And then also a, a large great report on breaking down silos and sharing data across. And um, thank you, Julie's put the, is putting the registration links in the chat and we'll also send these slides around. Um, and so with that, I apologize we went a minute over. I really appreciate everyone's attendance. Michelle and Erica, um, thank you so much for being part of this. Erica, I really appreciate you hurriedly providing your expertise in the question and answer sections and writing and also um, for weighing in so many times in really, really helpful practical ways. So thank you all again so much. Our contact information's there. We'll send a follow-up to everyone who registered with the slides and the recording and um, potentially some additional information if we're able to pull that together as well. So thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day and we hope to see you at the next webinar in September.